Okay, hello everybody. Um, tonight in our continuing series on how to uh, be e more eco-friendly in lawn and turf care uh, throughout the country, um, our guest is Bill Skirrett. He's president of ICT Organics. Uh, Bill and I have worked together for, geez, what, 15 years or so, Bill? Yep. Um, he uh, he's, he's president that supplies a line of minimum risk pesticides, biopesticides. Um, and aside from being a, uh, you know, just, just a great supplier of ours, we've become good friends over the years. So Bill, I'm just gonna turn it over to you and uh, thank you for taking the time out tonight. Everybody listen well. Well, thanks for having me, Barry. Yeah, we've been together quite a while through many escapades. Usually we're at, uh, a lot of shows this time of year, but there haven't been many shows. So, which is always fun. I always enjoy getting out and meeting all the landscapers and finding out what they're doing. I miss them. Um, ICT Organics was started 14 years ago, um, this month, actually. Uh, we came out with a uh, instant compost tea product was our first product. Uh, for uh, landscapers. We provide a, a, a series of uh, fertilizers as well as uh, pesticides. Um, so there's a, a bit of confusion on what organic is. So I'm gonna go through what the, um, what EPA, USDA, uh, those people, what they define as uh, their organic or uh, EPA exempt. The fields that you see in front of me, one is Vassar College and the other is Little League, Little League World Series. They use our uh, instant compost tea product in order to, and these, these pictures were taken um, right before they were using, uh, and after they were using the product, but before there were some gains. Uh, but that's our instant compost tea. So if you're looking for a cost-effective way to keep color and density in your turf, that's the way to do it. So there it is. Um, EPA, uh, if you, if you uh, make a pesticide in the United States, you have to register it with the EPA. Um, that's a very long process and very costly. Um, what they do have is a section called 25B exempt. Uh, 25B exempt uh, are what they, another EPA term is general, generally regarded as safe. So these are things, and I've got a list that's coming up. Um, and for you landscapers out there, typically um, EPA exempt don't have cast numbers, but they may. So if you're keeping records of what you're applying and you need a cast number, uh, sometimes it's not available with the EPA exempt products. Um, they include uh, non-GMO bacteria, fungi, enzymes, metabolites, as well as this is a list of active ingredients that are out there that you can use. These are what's called, these are exempt from registration from EPA um, and they're called generally regarded as safe. And there are things like citronella, um, corn gluten meal, cedarwood oil, castor oil. These are all the active ingredients um, that we use in our products in order to make uh, a lot of our pesticides. The USDA uh, has a program called the National Organic Program, and this is for growing food. So turf is kind of a different side of this. Turf really doesn't have a, like when you're growing food, doesn't have a, um, the landscaping industry doesn't have really a standard for what is uh, organic and what is not. So what we do is we use the USDA National Organic Program, or they call it NOP, uh, for, um, for formulating our products out there. And typically these are used in agriculture. And it says at the, bottom, at the bottom, you can't use, they've got a whole list of things, even the National Organic Program, 
And sometimes things that are that seem organic, you can't use because of how it's processed through an acid or uh, um, some process that they use that uh, renders it inorganic as a, as a product. So EPA and USDA, EPA handles all of the pesticides for the US. And then the USDA National Organic Program is for only gr in growing food. And then there's a company out of California called Omri, the Organic Materials Review Institute. And what they did is they become they became the de facto standard for the National Organic Program for USDA. Um, and you can take uh, us as a manufacturer, we can send our product in and show them um, how we process that product, how we make that product, and then they can certify it as, as uh, Omri. So if you're a grower in, in agriculture, you have a certifier that comes and certifies your farm. And then um, when, you, when you bring a product on, rather than having to go to the certifier every time to make sure that the product's okay, you can buy products that have already been reviewed by this group. And um, then you can use that on your organic certified farm. Omri is good for agriculture, but it doesn't really make sense in the landscaping. If you're trying to be green, you can use Omri approved uh, products and, um, and know that they're used in organic growing as well. But again, there's really no standard for organic in landscaping. There's a group called the Northeast Organic Farmers Association, NOFA. They have a accreditation process. You can go through, what is it, five days, Barry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Five day class. They and they have been doing it online too recently. Okay. Uh, but they do have an organic for landscapers. They do have, um, again, it's called Northeast Organic Farmers Association and uh, NOFA is what everybody calls it. They do have a standards program that you can go and uh, you can uh, go for five days and they teach you what's organic and what's not. They take organic pretty seriously. Um, they don't use any mined uh, products. So they don't use uh, like bat guano. They don't use uh, uh, peat moss. Anything that's mined, they consider not sustainable. So um, they do take it pretty seriously, but there, there are more and more landscapers out there that I noticed that have that on their card uh, when I get their card and it's got a NOFA accredited um, landscaper on there. Uh, but they're right. great. they only do classes, I think once a year. Is it once a year or they do them more now? I've kind of lost touch with them in the last couple of years. Yeah, they're, it, it's generally once a year, but with the online courses, um, I'm not quite sure what the schedule is. They generally do it during the winter. Yeah. Um, I, I do also want to mention that Rutgers has an organic landscape um, course that uh, was very good. It's, it's kind of gone dormant a bit. Um, I'm not sure if they lost funding for that or what, but there is, there is a, a standards for them too that you can find online. Um, one of the things that were, um, that I've experienced over the 13 years that I've been in, the, in, in this side of the business um, is there are a lot of uh, stricter regulations uh, for landscapers and what you can use and what you can't use. Um, and one of the driving forces was a USGS study from 1992 to 2005. They had 5,000 sites across the country where they tested um, the water in streams as well as in wells and lakes, sediments, in fish. But there were 5,000 different sites over multiple, multiple years. Um, when it was released in 2007, the, the talk was is that EPA was holding it back um, because it was so controversial. Um, but what they found was, this is the one thing that they found is that stream water in agricultural areas 
had 97% of the streams tested positive for pesticides. They did um, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, uh, Yellowstone. There were a lot of, of these 5,000 sites. There were a lot of what's called undeveloped areas. Um, these are places where nobody's sprayed a pesticide ever. And they found 65% of the water tested had pesticides in it. What happens when you spray a pesticide is it evaporates up into the clouds and then it rains down wherever it happens to be raining. Um, so one of the things that this study showed over 5,000 different sites in the U.S. is just because you're putting pesticides down on your property, um, it actually goes a lot of other different places. Um, and then the organic chloride compounds in fish and sediment, which is on the right, uh, these are things like DDT that have been banned since 1972. One of the things that they found is that in sediment, um, in streams, the DDT levels were exactly the same as they were in, in 1992 when it was banned. And this is in 2005. So these things are very persistent. Uh, they stay in the environment for a very long time. Uh, but you can see that throughout the country, we've got pesticides in our water, in our streams, in our sediment. Um, so it's something that we need to stay, obviously need to stay away from. But I, I thought this was a, just a glaring chart. One of the things um, that we founded ICT Organics on uh, was some of the basis of uh, Elaine Ingham's work over the years. I saw her in, gosh, 2005 in a presentation and it uh, really changed how I thought about how soils work. And um, it's about how microorganisms, um, whether they be uh, worms or microbes or fungi work with plants. The plants have been around for 2 billion years. They've kind of figured out uh, how to work with the soil. Um, we're seeing really interesting ways of being able to observe this. We're getting really good um, lab work that's coming out of a lot of universities and being able to look at the soil and see what kind of microorganisms are there, uh, which ones work with plants, uh, which ones are pathogens, which ones help the host. Um, but these guys have been doing this for 600 million years. so. One of the things that Paul Stamets that we were talking about earlier uh, talked about in one of his presentations is, is uh, 600 million years ago, there was a uh, asteroid that hit the earth around the, what's now the Yucatan Peninsula area. Um, and it blocked out the sun for, they say decades, but nobody was there to know. Um, one of the things that happened was fungi don't need photosynthesis in order to uh, survive. And so what happened was the plants that had an association with fungi uh, were able to survive um, because they were able to get nutrients through the soil from the fungi. Um, and they were able to survive the, the, the winter of the earth um, through having an association with the fungi that were there in the soil. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, it's one of our products too, is, um, is, is fun, uh, fungal control. A lot of the landscapers that are out there, you all have uh, fungal issues. A lot of people put down fungicides. Um, I wanted to show one of our fungicides, which is called our NPP product. Um, a lot of the research that's out there is not on turf. We, it's in agriculture because it's such a, a, a large, a profitable uh, product. But this is a thing called chitosan. Chitosan comes from um, the shells of uh, shrimp, lobsters. Um, you have chitosan in your hair. Um, you have chit chitin in your hair. Chitosan is the liquid version of chitin. Um, and what it does with plants is it mimics a pathogen attack. And what the plant does is it, it, uh, it makes a, uh, a much 
thicker cuticle. Um, it fills in the spaces between the cells, but this is a bell pepper that's been inoculated with a pathogen. And so then they spray chitosin, which is our NPP product. Um, and it's really interesting how the plant responds to that. So as a preventative, as well as a curative, our NPP product works really well. It works this, the same way in all plants. Um, they see it, it enters the leaf of the plant and they see it as a, a fungal pathogen, although it's not. And what they do is they increase their enzymes. And again, I've got my slides out of place here, but we'll go to another interesting, um, there are fungi that eat fungi. So in this case, there's a fungi called trichoderma, which likes to prey on other fungi. Um, in this case, it's pythium, which is a very common uh, fungal disease in turf, and it will wipe out turf pretty darn quick. Um, you can use trichoderma, which is in our tea product, in order to uh, control the pathogens that are out there. And what's very interesting is called a, a vampire fungi. And the reason is, is that it leaves two holes in the fungi that it's feeding on. And it sucks, basically sucks all of the um, energy out of it. So this is a, a parasite feeding on a parasite, basically. So what it does is it actually, trichoderma actually uses chitinase enzymes to break down the cell wall of the fungus, and then it feeds on the fungus and kills it. So there are, are, there are some really interesting ways to go about controlling rather than using a, um, a fungicide. You can actually use other fungus to control your fungal diseases, which is pretty cool. Again, they've been doing this 600 million years. They've kind of got it figured out. Here's another slide. I like to put this slide up just because it's so cool. But this is um, a nematode trapping fungi. And as you can see, it's got a collar around the nematode. And then what it does is it basically eats it once it's trapped it. And it's got these hoops. You can see the hoops in the background. And the nematode is just swimming along, doing its thing through the soil. And it'll come across one of these hoops, and the fungi will grab it. And then it uses it for food. And then, yeah, Bill, that, that's one of my favorite slides. I, I love it. Um, one thing I found out after seeing this is that most of the, the bad nematodes are larger. And the, there are also beneficial nematodes. And they're smaller, and the, and the fungi don't seem to attack them. So <laughs> nature is wonderful. Yeah, again, they've been doing it 600 million years. They've kind of got it figured out. But it's so cool, I, didn't, I had never even thought, when I came into the industry, I'd never even thought of something like this that was going on in the soil. Oh, here's the other slide that was out of place. This shows the plant that was back of that, that green pepper, I think this is in cucumbers, um, but it shows what happens when you apply chitin or chitosin to a plant. And basically what it does is it makes all these enzymes and metabolites in order to um, to fight off what it thinks is a pathogen. And you can see the increases in the plant's activity making enzymes in order to protect itself. So it's a really good tool to use for, I spray it on my tomatoes in the spring and they'll just sit there for about a, a week or so and they get real thick and real nice and then they grow really well. And we have very little fungal issues with our tomatoes. So we're talking about this uh, NPP product is the one uh, that's the main ingredient in our, our uh, NPP. Chitosin. Um, chitosin is the liquid version of chitin, but again, chitin is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's in your fingernails. It's in your hair. It's in the, the exoskeleton of grubs. Of, um, of, it's everywhere. So what we do is we use an acid process in order to break down chitin into chitosan. And um, 
and you can spray it out at very small rates. It's very cost effective. It's very um, non-toxic as well. So if there are times where you need to control fungal disease, you can do it with a very non-toxic uh, product um, and also helps the plant. So as a uh, cure, curative or as a, as a uh, beforehand spraying it out before. If you go out and typically in the mid-Atlantic where I am, we get fungal disease when the nights go above 75 degrees and stay there. Um, so that's typically July, August timeframe. So you can go out ahead of time and, um, and then if you've got fungal disease, you can also use it as a curative. Yeah, and Bill taught me a lesson with some of my rhododendrons where they had fungal problems. So um, I did a soil drench with the NPP, uh, but it's a two-step process because you need to rebuild the, the fungi that's in the soil, the, the beneficial fungi. So, um, you know, we, we would first do the soil drench with the NPP and then put other um, um, fun beneficial fungi into the soil to help recover. Yeah, that's a very good point. When you do use that, it's indiscriminate. Um, if you spray it on a mushroom and come back five minutes later, it will actually, its mode of action on um, fungi is plants make their, make their cells from calcium. Fungi make their cells from chitin. Um, so when you spray chitosan, um, it hydrolyzes the chitin or turns to water. Um, so if you were to spray it on a mushroom and come back five minutes later, it'll be a little black blob on the, on the ground. Um, and it basically on a cellular level, it breaks down the chitin that's in the mushroom or the fungi. Um, so you're, it's indiscriminate. It doesn't care whether you're a good fungi or a bad fungi. Um, so you do need to come back and uh, and apply some type of uh, compost tea, something to bring those guys back. And NPP is also good for insect controls too, right? It is, we use NPP in the fall when it's hot in order to um, control grubs. Grubs have, their body exoskeleton is made from chitin. Um, so when you apply NPP, it's actually, um, I'll get a little deep here, but it's, it's a metabolic trigger. So there are, in that slide before, you saw that there are fungi that, pro, that make a chitinase enzyme. Chitinase enzymes break down chitin in order for them to enter the exterior of the fungi. So when you spray NPP, you're putting out all kinds of chitin in the ground which makes the, the, um, the microbes that eat that, they just go nuts. Bacteria can double their numbers in 20 minutes. So um, when you spray down NPP, you, the bacterial levels go through the roof, the ones that make the chitinase enzyme. Well, it's also destroying the exoskeleton of any grubs that are in the, in the soil. And often we get phone calls saying, there are grubs climbing out of the ground. I just replied this like an hour ago and they're literally grubs climbing out of the ground. And they're trying to get away from all the chitinase enzymes that are being produced by the bacteria and fungi in the soil because it's literally destroying their exoskeleton. Um, we're gonna go through a couple of products that we have. We just went over NPP. I'll have a slide on um, some of those, those things. Uh, the first one that's one of our more popular uh, products is our Cedar Cure product. Um, you can use it on mosquitoes, uh, ticks, fleas, also um, on grubs. It destroys the exoskeleton of the grubs, but it does need to be watered in so you can get in where the grubs are. Um, but it's effective on all four stages of mosquito. Cedarwood oil is one of those exempt, what's called generally regarded as safe things from the EPA. Uh, works on fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes at very low concentrations. If you look at the data that's out there, one third of 1% 1 
of uh, cedarwood oil kills mosquitoes. So it's at very small rates that you can kill mosquitoes and ticks and fleas. Um, it's a very nice way to, very safe way to uh, control fleas in a yard if people have dogs, cats, that sort of thing. Um, one of the things about treating mosquitoes is it will kill all four stages of mosquito, um, but there's no repellent. And that's one of the reasons why we made our other product, which we'll go over in a minute, which is Mosquito Cure. Um, so you can kill what's out there right now, but there's nothing there to repel them from coming back in. Um, and one of the interesting things is garlic. There's uh, some data out there and, and trials is garlic um, is like jamming a radio for mosquitoes. They can't see into the area. They can't see through garlic for some reason. Um, so that if there's nothing there for them to feast on, then they typically stay out of the area. So, um, but I'll go through that in, in just a minute. Cedar cure is good for uh, grub control. In grub control, um, we're typically using it at the first and second instar, at the egg stage, which is the first, and then there's a second instar. But that's when the grubs are the most vulnerable. So when, um, when it's uh, around here in the mid-Atlantic, end of June, beginning of July, sometimes mid-July, depending on the spring and how hot or cold it's been or how wet it's been. Um, but when the beetles are mating, when you see them flying in the air, they're mating and laying eggs. So uh, what we wanna do is put down the cedar cure to kill all of the eggs that they've been laying. So if you've got an area that uh, has been typical to, uh, to rub infestation, this is a great way to control it. It's typically done uh, again in July. Uh, but you do want to water it. If they're in the first instar, they're crawling into the soil and they're typically an inch or two below the soil, starting to, uh, they're, they're just hanging out. And, um, and later on, they start destroying the plant. They start eating the roots of the plants. Um, and you start to see, like in August and September, you'll start to see the grub infestation issues with your turf. Um, but this will kill the eggs and in the first instar. So that's when we want to get that in there. It works really well. Uh, Mosquito Cure is a product that we were asked to make, and I think it's been out for eight years. Um, we've literally had no returns on this product. Um, we've had nobody call and say, hey, it didn't work. Um, our sales continue to grow. It's five essential oils. So cedarwood oil is the main ingredient uh, for uh, killing mosquitoes. And then we've got the things in order to repel them. Red thyme oil is surprisingly a very good repellent uh, for mosquitoes. These things hang around for three or four weeks, the lemongrass, citronella, these essential oils. Um, if there's a lot of rain, you may have to go out earlier. Uh, but typically, all of the people we sell to, they go out once a month uh, for mosquito control, and they have um, very few callbacks. We've got one customer up in um, near Stanford, Connecticut. He's got 5,000 customers. He had 18 callbacks last year. He said of those 18, probably four were real. Um, because he'll go out and, and make sure, um, but that's pretty good. Uh, one yeah, gallon the, yeah, the feed. Acres, so it's very cost effective. Yeah. Uh, four ounces of mosquito cure and three gallons of water, throw it in a steel 450 backpack blower sprayer, um, and go out and spray. Um, you're trying to coat the entire area. Uh, you want to get the shrubs underneath the deck, you want to get the turf, you want to get the entire property, because what you're trying to do is not only kill the four stages of uh, mosquitoes that are out there, but you're also getting that uh, repellency as well. 
So this is again, a very, as soon as it dries, uh, people say, when can I put my pets or my kids back out? Uh, as soon as it dries, it's fine. Um, we just don't want the dog to go out and get it on his paws when it's wet and maybe track it back in, or he may have some irritation from the, from the spray. It's not, um, again, four ounces and three gallons of water. It's not a lot. It's, um, we've, it's a very concentrated mix. That's why it can treat 11 acres. Um, yeah, the, the, the combination of Cheetah Cure and Mosquito Cure is, uh, it, it's one of our biggest sellers and it's, um, all we get is compliments and, and thank you for, <laughs> for getting these products to them. Uh, it, it, um, also, just correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, but it also will kill the eggs. It, yes, it does, it does all four stages. So it does grub, larva, it does, um, I'm sorry, the, yeah, all four stages. So if you were to spray it on a puddle, um, the little nymphs that are in swimming in the water, um, in just 30 seconds, they're all dead. And basically, uh, insects breathe through their body. So what essential oils do is they coat them and then the insect can't breathe. Um, it also, uh, cedarwood oil also um, creates what, what I call a leaky nervous system. So in, in insects, the way their nervous system works, um, the cedarwood oil actually breaks a connection. Um, so they may not die right away, but often you'll see insects spinning in circles or um, they're unable to. The other thing that's interesting about essential oils is it masks pheromones. So um, the reason that grubs are grubs, and I mean, the reason beetles fly around and mosquitoes fly around is because they need to mate, lay eggs, and then die. If they can't smell the pheromone or, or uh, detect that there's a pheromone in the area, which essential oils mask, um, they're not going to come in the area because there's no mate there for them. So a lot of these things not only will kill, but they also mask all the pheromones that are going on. So they don't even want to come into the area because there's no mate there for them. But again, the ticket mosquito control is at the bottom. You just add a half ounce of uh, cedar cure in the four ounces of mosquito cure and, um, and go spray. And if you see like Mosquito Joe and the Mosquito Squad, and there are a lot of different companies out there. They typically have a steel 450 in the back, um, and they'll just go out and spray the, the yard with that. Some people like to drag a hose. They think it's more impressive. Um, you can do either, but you do need to get the entire site. We're going to move on to another product, which is our glutinate product. Uh, we're self <laughs> a lot of this right now. We can't keep up with uh, the demand. Um, but it was patented by Iowa State University in 1992. And they've got 20 years of trials. If you go on their site and type in uh, corn gluten meal, it will take you to the um, doctor who patented it. And they've got um, on turf, they have 20 years of field trials on there. Um, one gallon treats 4,000 square feet. And that's equivalent to 80 pounds of granular. So if you guys are out there, you're supposed to put 20 pounds of granular down per thousand square feet of the granular product. Um, that's also two pounds of nitrogen. Um, so uh, a lot of states only have, in Maryland, for instance, where I am, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you only can put down three pounds of nitrogen per year. Um, and that's because we're around bodies of water like the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and the Atlantic Ocean, and they're trying to keep the algae down. So you can only put down three pounds of nitrogen per year on a site per thousand square feet. Um, so if you put down 20 pounds of granular uh, corn gluten meal in the spring, you've basically blown your nitrogen budget for the year. The glutinate that we have is uh, liquid. It's only 1.5% nitrogen. So you're doing pre-emergent control um, without the chemical pesticides, and um, you're not ruining your nitrogen budget, budget at the same time. If you look at the Iowa State University trials that they've done, typically 
it's low 70, 73, 74% control in the first year. Um, and then it goes to low 80% control in the second year. And it gets a little better year after year. The, the, the thought on that is that you're destroying the weed seed um, that are there. So there are less and less weed seeds every year because you're using a pre-emergent. Um, its mode of action is it ulcerates the root of the germinating seed. Um, so it can't become a plant. So it loses its root basically. Um, mix rate is three to one. If some of you are out there, I've got it in tips coming up, but um, some of you are out there, you do two gallons per thousand square feet or three gallons per thousand square feet. It, it's fine. Water is just a carrier. Um, so you can um, use as much water as you need in order to go out, just making sure that you're putting out one quart of glutenate per thousand square feet. Some of our other products that we've got, we've got another essential oil product. It was our first one um, called Essential One. It's a general pesticide typically used um, for perimeter. Um, this is really good for soft bodied insects, uh, spiders, that sort of thing. Um, ants hate this stuff. If you spray it down, you know how they get the ants with this conga line where there's a thousand ants in a line, they're all following each other. If you spray it in that conga line, they'll go a mile out of their way to get around this stuff. What we found in our first trials many years ago in Florida is that it moved, um, it moved the ants off of the property. They have fire ant issues down there. It doesn't kill the hive, it doesn't kill them, but they dislike it so much that they actually move into another area where it's not being applied. Um, so you don't have the fire ant issues on your property in the south with this product um, because they basically move somewhere else. Castor oil is a very good desiccant. So if you've got things like tent caterpillars you're trying to take care of um, and you spray uh, the essential oil product, um, they'll be a little crispy, look like a little french fry about 10 minutes later. It's also got white pepper in it, which is used uh, to discourage browsers like uh, rabbits and deer. So you can use it as a uh, repellent as well for those guys. Our one, two, three tree product is a biological fertilizer. It's fungally dominant. Um, if you've read any of Elaine Ingham's or followed some of the, the people that are out there in the organic side, they'll talk about fungally dominant and uh, bacterially dominant compost teas. Um, this product is a biological fertilizer. We actually uh, also use a uh, ferment of kelp and fish and micronutrients in that. So it does have a bit of a fishy smell to it, um, but it is a fungally dominant compost tea, if you will. Our hydro seed product is, can be used in any of the seeding applications. Um, I've got Photos of um, Kentucky bluegrass typically takes three weeks in order to germinate. Um, we've seen it germinate in five days. So if you've got a lot of the hydro seed guys will use it when they're on hills, when they're, when they're in a position where they can't fail is where they'll use our hydro seed product or if they're just trying to get quick germination. It really works well. And you're getting all of the good microorganisms on there first. These are, um, these are known bacteria and fungi that are, uh, that are the good guys. Uh, our instant compost tea, that was the first product we came out with at ICT Organics. It's a bacterially dominant compost tea. Um, what we found in the industry was um, people love to make compost tea, but once you get over 100 customers, 150 customers, the logistics of trying to make your own compost tea is very difficult. Um, so we've got a three-part mix. If you're using city water, it includes a dechlorinator, so you can de uh, dechlorinate the water. Um, you put the microbes in, and then we've got a food source, which is another ferment that we do of, uh, of bacteria and fungal foods. It's got humates and some other things in there that, um, that all the microbes love. 
So what you're doing is you're mixing up these dormant and spore form microorganisms into water, and then you're giving them a food source, and then you're applying. It's got an NPK of like, a, it's a 202 is what's on the label. Um, so if you're looking for um, keeping color and density in your turf, the instant compost tea is the, the way to go. Um, you're, you're putting out very little, maybe a eighth of a pound per thousand square feet of nitrogen. Uh, but then we've got a lot of nitrogen fixers in there too. So over time, when they grow out, um, we did some trials with ag on some nitrogen fixers. Some of the ones that we use, we were going to do a standalone product for ag. And we showed that you could produce 40 pounds per acre of nitrogen with these nitrogen fixers. Um, and one of the reasons why no-till ag is becoming so popular is because if you get if you get these guys established, they're able to produce all of the nitrogen to well, 40 pounds per acre, let's put it in perspective. Corn wants 120 pounds per acre. So you're providing one third of the amount of nitrogen. Um, but when you're in a, a till type environment, you're destroying that environment for, you're destroying the bacteria and the fungal sources, and you have to start back over again. Um, so this really works well for turf because over time you're getting um, all of these great nitrogen fixtures and fungi and things that are helping. So your inputs as far as nitrogen, fungicides, all of those things go down. And that's one of the things that we're all, we've all been trying to promote in this industry for a long time. Uh, our compost tea is not brewed. You just mix it with water. So one carton treats 90,000 square feet, two acres basically. Um, you can take that whole thing and mix it into 180 gallons of water and go spray and that'll do 90,000 square feet. We've got a new product out. Um, labels are being done as we speak. Um, it's called Spindrift. It's a spray adjuvant. It's uh, again, USDA not compliant. That's the way we try to design all of our products so that you can use it in agriculture if you want it. We don't sell to agriculture, not much, um, but it is not compliant. It's used in uh, gly glyphosate and dicamba applications. Um, right now, if anybody's using either of those products, do you realize how expensive they are? Um, this is used for um, making things rainproof, sunproof, sticker tacker. Um, so you don't have to come back and respray. It works extremely well. We've got uh, people in the West in agriculture. Um, our, our chemists have been making this for years for people out West. And we've decided to bring this adjuvant into uh, ICT organics and give it and distribute it. I use very little product, only two pints per hundred gallons of mix. So it's very cost effective as well. Um, so you're using what, eight pints in a, so you're only using a quarter of a gallon kind of thing. Um, this is a, a, a great product. And if you are out spraying uh, chemicals, you need to find some way to make it work really well because the cost of these things has gone through, uh, it's just astronomical. Um, so this is a great way to make your sprays work better. And, uh, and it's an organic way to do it too. It's, it's, it can be organically certified. Um, some of the tips, essential oils, no matter what kind of essential oil you're using, um, you shouldn't spray when temperatures are over 85 degrees. Um, basically what happens is you're putting the, the essential oil coats the plant and it's like putting it into a plastic bag, if you will. Um, you're covering the plant so it's not able to, to um, I can't think of the technical term, but it can't get rid of its water. Um, and at the same time, you're coating this thing. So once the temperatures get that hot, don't go when it's 90 degrees out and it's two or three in the afternoon and your sites are water stressed or heat stressed, um, you'll definitely get black spots. You'll get spotting on the plants. Um, so for your hydrangeas and your 
uh, those those kinds of things. Um, it will get spotting on the leaf, um, but it could cause a lot of wilt and it could actually kill the plant. So be careful when it's hot out and you're spraying essential oils. You can go out in the morning. We've got a golf course superintendent that we play with um, that's uh, near us. We went out uh, when this, we went out uh, eight, nine years ago and it was supposed to be 105 that day. So we went out in the morning, it was about 70 and sprayed and we sprayed annuals and we sprayed perennials and we sprayed trees and we sprayed turf and um, they did fine. So you can spray in the morning when things aren't heat stressed or water stressed. Just don't go out in the afternoon when things are already wilting. Uh, again, here's the tip on glutinate. Water is a carrier. You put out three gallons per mix. Just adjust your mix accordingly. Um, glutinate is very high in protein. It's 80% protein. Um, so I don't know if you've left eggs in a pan, uh, but they're tough to get off. So if you've sprayed glutinate on a sidewalk or siding of a house or something like that, rinse it off because it's very difficult to get it off once it's dried. And uh, everybody should know that pre-emergence uh, timing is critical with pre-emergence. Um, with a glutinate product, you've got a six to eight week window, depending how wet that spring is. So you want to put it down when you're going after your nemesis. So if it's crabgrass, crabgrass wants the soil temperature to be 60 degrees. This still amazes me that seeds actually know when they're supposed to germinate. I don't get this. There are some seeds that they've already germinated because they like cold weather and other ones that ger don't germinate until May or June. But uh, just whatever your nemesis is, um, uh, just find out what the soil temperature is for that and then um, apply accordingly. So if you're going after crabgrass, so in my area in the mid-Atlantic, we don't see crabgrass till the end of May. Uh, so you may want to go out at the beginning of May. Depends on the spring, but the um, as the soil temperature is going from 50 to 55 is when you want to start doing that. Um, and the USDA, believe it or not, has excellent uh, monitors all over the country on soil temperature at one inch, two inch, four inches, one foot uh, for all of the agriculture that goes on because they want to plant when the soil temperature is a certain time. So you can go on USDA and type in soil temperatures and it'll take you to your zip code and you can find out what your soil temperatures are near you. They've got tens of thousands of monitors that are out there all over the country to monitor soil temperatures. The next frontier is under your feet is what uh, some people have said in the past. Um, the, the amount of information that's coming out and the data that we're getting from university studies on microorganisms and their ability to work with plants has really become staggering. Um, this is some organic soil they were putting in a retaining wall. And uh, the guy had been using our products for years. And, and uh, so he just wanted to take a tape measure and, and show that he had roots that went down 12, 13, 14 inches, um, which is great for drought relief. Um, there's lots of cool uh, heat relief, that sort of thing. So his, their turf does really well. And here's a nice golf course. But thanks uh, for joining us. And I guess we're open for questions. Yeah, Bill, I'll just make the comment that, you know, when, when you and I both started uh, 15 some odd years ago, and, you know, we, we learned from Elaine Ingham and some other people about the soil food web, and you know we start talking about it, and people thought we were the strangest creatures in the world. <laughs> and now things have changed. There's a lot more information out there, and universities are saying the same thing now. And it's it's it, it's really it, it's really changed everything about how you and I have looked at, at turf grass and other plants, and, and it's. Well, and what, what it's proven is that you can, you can, um, one of the other organic tips that
that you'll see if you work around some of these guys who have been doing it a long time is um, they all carry seed with them. So if they see yeah. a little patch that's open, something's going to grow there and they'll throw some seed on it. But they're really yeah. big into seeding in the fall and applying compost in the fall um, in order to keep organic matter. So what you're trying to do is get your organic matter in your soil up to 2% is a good start. We would rather see it between five and 7%. We did some studies with uh, spring green out of um, Chicago years ago. And they were interested in our compost tea, which they use, uh, but they wanted to see which compost was best because they had all these claims about whose compost was best. So they did 10 by 10 squares right in front of their office and they put compost down um, from XYZ company in five different plots and they replicated it off in the back just to see if it was any different. And the next year there was no change. And they couldn't understand why applying compost um, didn't make a change to their soil. Well, they did a soil organic matter reading that it was 9%. And they were in that great Midwestern soil that has lots of organic matter. And they put down more compost and it really didn't change anything because the soil organic matter was already at nine. Yeah. Um, so we good organic program is tester soil. Um, a lot of states are requiring you to test soil to even apply anything. Uh, so yeah, test your soil. If your organic matter is at two, that's a good start. Um, we'd rather see it between five and 7%. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned in a, a, one of the other talks we had that, uh, you know, our property, we're, we're in South Jersey, it's very sandy soil. And um, I was originally at maybe two, two and a half percent organic matter. And, you know, using things like some of your products and, and some other composting techniques and stuff, it's, it's, we've gotten it up to seven to 8%. Nice. And, and because of that, we don't, with our turf, we don't have any fungal issues or anything at all like that. So it, it all fits in the system that well. Wait. Yeah, so your inputs are minimal once you're able to get that balance going in the microorganism. Right, right. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up before we go, um, you know, Bill mentioned these, these are EPA exempt products um, and it, it, it's very strict what the EPA regulations are to, to meet those needs. Um, but you also have to deal with state regulations too. In, in some states, you do not need a pesticide license to apply it professionally. In other states, you do. So you need to be aware of what the um, what the regulations are in your particular state. Yeah, that's a very good point. Like in New York, you don't have to have a pesticide license to spray 25B exempt, but in New Jersey, you do. And I think you got that backwards. Is it backwards? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Although when you go to schools, you know they have school IPM program. Um, not that you need a license for uh, EPA exempt in, in New Jersey. Um, you do have to do all the other things. You do have to notify everybody, parents and workers and this and that when you're when they're about to make applications, whether it's EPA exempt or not. Yeah, and then in Connecticut, you don't you have to have a pesticide license to put down 25B, but you don't have to notify. Yeah. So Connecticut's big because they don't have to notify their neighbor, the neighbors that they're going to come down and spray pesticides, right. which is huge. Right. Yeah. And one, one thing I bring up all the time in New Jersey, and most applicators don't realize that, but if you're spraying a pesticide, um, that, that can yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the exact wordage of it, but um, if you're spraying pesticides, you have to notify every beekeeper that is within, I think, ten miles. Wow. So, yeah, and um, nobody adheres to that. When when I, I was running a pesticide division for a tree care company up in North Jersey, you know, we had we had 10 spray rigs going out every day. So <laughs> we, we, we adhered to the law and I was just on the phone 
constantly telling people, yeah, we're going to be spraying again. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge expense. Yeah, yeah. So, well, again, Bill, thank you very much, not just for the presentation, but for all the years we've worked together. Um, and I hope to see you thank soon. You it's been a while. <laughs> all of our products through Barry. And one of the great things about Barry, and I send hundreds of people to him a year, um, is he also has other products um, that he can do. He's got a great uh, granular fertilizer product line. Um, he's got a lot of other products that he touches uh, for other applications if our application doesn't fit what you're trying to do. And he's got knowledge in the industry, which is huge. Thank you. Bill, um, I just had a kind of a comment. Um, and I, I'm wondering with you, and of course I got to call just at that moment. Um, I'm wondering the U, USGS used to do um, rainwater measurements um, around glyphosate. They used to measure how much glyphosate was found in rainwater samples, um, but they stopped posting publicly. And I'm wondering if you've been following that data. I haven't, no. Yeah, okay. it, in 2012, they stopped posting and it was starting to become a pretty alarming amount um, to the point where you're like, wow, okay, so that was originally patented as an industrial pipe cleaner, then like an incredibly potent antibiotic, and then like a weed killer. And I can't help think like, wow, we've got like measurable amounts of liquid death raining down on us. Um, and the government's decided to stop posting those numbers. And I just, it just makes me nervous for our planet. You know well, what I mean? Well, it took the EPA two years to release that, that, uh, that thing. They, they stopped in 2005. They had all of that done. Um, and they it didn't get posted until 2007. And so the, the insiders say that it was leaked and that they had to bring it out. But there apparently the EPA was not going to release that information about pesticides in waters and streams. One of the things, one of the big um, pesticides that's used in ag is atrazine. And um, four or, or six-legged frogs are pretty common in the middle of the country now. Um, in the uh, Long Island Sound, all of the, um, the flounder have two sexes. And that's the same with smallmouth bass in the Potomac River near uh, uh, in DC, is the smallmouth bass have two sexes. Um, and this is from atrazine. And they say that it doesn't go over to um, a vertebrae, is that these, these pesticides are fine on insects, but they don't go over to vertebrates. And I find that hard to believe with six legged frogs and um, fish with two sexes. You know whose work you're going to want to look into is um, Dr. Tyrone Hayes. He's from, he's from UC Berkeley and he's a professor. And there was a nine page article written by Rachel Aviv a few years ago in um, The New Yorker. Yeah, nine pages in the New Yorker, Rachel Aviv. And it tells the story of how Tyrone Hayes went around the country. Um, he, first, he was hired by Syngenta to do the atrazine safety trials. And turns out what he found out is that it wasn't safe. And he got into an interesting legal battle uh, with Syngenta because they had hired, I forget, like nine scientists that reread his data and decided it was safe. And they had an argument about safety and who owns the data. And then the preceding 15 years um, culminated in a lawsuit where Tyrone Hayes actually sued Syngenta um, because he was able to prove that they went after him. And it was really interesting. The article talks about it because he started going around the country talking about the impacts of atrazine in waterways to amphibians. Um, and he also alludes to the fact that he had coworkers working on atrazine trials with uh, mammals, and they had some interesting mammary cancers popping up. Um, well, it's so an just, endo it's an endocrine disruptor. Yeah, that's how it yeah. works. It, it destroy it disrupts the endocrine system within the insect. 
is its mode of action. And it also does that to everything else. I mean, why they don't think it does, I'm not quite sure. It's not even really my area of expertise, but it's really interesting to see what some of these conventional products do. I mean, on land application, they're very dangerous, but when they get into an aquatic setting, uh, they seem to have uh, a much more uh, dangerous effect. Yeah, and in that USGS paper, and I won't go on um, much more about it, but um, they had, I forget what the term was, but they had a term when they had 10 or more pesticides that were in the same water column or in the sediment. Um, and they really don't know what that chemical makes itself. When you have multiple pesticides all joining together, sure they've done testing on rabbits and dogs and, um, and fish and that sort of thing. But when five or 10 or 12 different chemicals all get together, um, they don't know what that compound is. And uh, it's yeah, pretty, pretty the, the combination effect. The, the other thing, people don't often think about this either. And, and I found this to be interesting that um, with the class action lawsuits in California, it was really dermal uh, application problems, like the, the applicators got it splashed on them or, or somehow that it was really, they didn't, nobody, I mean, everybody thinks about like, I don't want to eat a weed killer or I don't want to breathe it in, but what happens if I get it kind of sprayed on me, you know, and it seemed like the majority of the class action complaints revolved around dermal, uh, dermal getting into the skin of the applicator. And, right. you know, and that's where the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma stories came out. And then that was the heart of the lawsuit. Um, but yeah, atrazine, I mean, it's like you know, very few people are looking at the impacts to the applicator. I think that's a conversation that, you know, landscapers and land care professionals really need to be having and thinking about the other the other thing is that not everybody knows this and this is kind of like you know again not my specialty but glyphosate breaks down into metabolites that are actually more dangerous than glyphosate and i think you're going to see that coming out um more and more information to that effect coming out um in the not too distant future but those are things to think about too wow something it's more dangerous as it breaks down Anyhow, so I'm, I'm excited that there's alternatives, you know, because this is the future. Well, it's, it's now, too. <laughs> and yeah. that, that's, you know, all the points you're making are, you know, some of the reasons why we, why we founded um, TechTerra to give other alternative products to the landscape industry. So. Yeah, and, and tonight there's even a, at 9 o'clock Eastern time, there's a Xerces Society Pollinators in Peril uh, webinar going on for an hour and a half for you uh, late night owls out there that want to watch it it's also going to be recorded Barry I'll shoot you the recording if you you know people want to watch yeah. it yeah definitely thanks around. thanks for that yeah so yeah so next week um we have a big treat we have Chip Osborne who's um probably how can I say it the guru for organic lawn care um Chip is known nationally he's worked with all kinds of groups teaching people how to, to get great results um, with, with, within an organic system. So um, you don't want to miss this. He'll be on next week. So, and with that, I'm going to say thank you to everyone. Uh, all attendees, you, you will get a survey to fill out for us. It helps us a great deal in you know, finding out um, if these, these webinars are helpful. Um, specifically what worked for you and how we can make them better because we, we we do like to get this information out to as many people as we can so with that i'm going to sign off and say again thank you everybody and we'll see you next week thanks guys thanks guys thanks barry thank you